It really is good to see you, <clears throat> and I'm so delighted that God speaks, and I'm so delighted every time He speaks, regardless of who He speaks through, we want to hear Him, That's right. and we want to say yes, and part of these moments and times that we come together is basically because we want to connect with each other, but more than that, we want to connect with the Father, yeah. and we want to hear what it is He's saying to us. I think there's been a few prophetic words this week, pictures Something of us as a battle people, people who are soldiers. How many of you know we're soldiers? Yeah. You might not look like battle and war, but we're in a battle. We're in a war, and it's like we've been out there battling in the kingdom, understanding the battle belongs to the Lord, but we've still got to fight. We've still got to walk this out. We walk out the victory, the finished work of Jesus, but we've got to walk it out. And at times, we kind of get battle-weary. We face stuff, we get hit, we get hurt, and we come into these moments, and it's not survival, but God brings us together, and He wants to just give us fresh revelation, courage, He wants to clothe us, He wants to enlarge us, He, wa he wants us to drink deep, he wants to bring healing, wholeness, effectiveness, adjust, and maybe can I suggest some marching orders, some of what we were involved in, He's saying, let go. So you can embrace what it is He still has for us. Some of us is to contend and keep going. But it's not hanging in there and hoping for the best. It's empowered from on high. Understanding the finished work of Jesus. I, I, I use this illustration a couple of times, so forgive me, but I'm not sure who's heard what. But I love the fact that we get to watch sport. I do like sport, and it's not a sin. In heaven, you'll see, we'll be watching Liverpool win all the games. <laughs> Maybe the heaven I'm going to anyway. So, and, and I love to watch football and I love to watch sport and I love to watch my team win. And you know, they don't always win, but when they do win, it's awesome. But you know, at the end of a season, what happens is whether you win the Super Bowl or the hockey or whatever it is you're playing, at the end of that season, you go back to start again at ground zero. And every team, whether they win or not, has to go back and start again for the next season and hopefully can do it again. <laughs> And that's part of the joy of watching this game we watch. But the good news about Jesus Christ, friends, is it's not to be done again. He doesn't go back to have to do it again every year. It's been done, finished. Amen. It has been done. Yeah. And because it's done, it has eternal ramifications forever for everyone. And when we celebrate the winning of our team, and when our team wins, it's like a huge celebration. But actually, at the end of the day, it means nothing, because back to the reality of trying again. But how much more should we rejoice and celebrate in the finished work of Jesus? It is finished. Nowhere does He have to do it again. It's been done. And those ramifications are for us here tonight and for everyone around the world. That He's done it all. We've just celebrated Easter. Isn't Easter awesome? I mean, Easter is such a wonderful celebration. In our country, it's like the Super Bowl Sunday. It's like that's the day that most Americans will come to church. And so we build everything around this big Sunday where people are going to come. And Friday is like Good Friday because Good Friday is Jesus died on Good Friday. And we celebrate. And then there's this in-between Saturday day that we don't know, but something's happening. But Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. Resurrected Sunday. Remember that? And then suddenly Resurrection Sunday comes. And we quote, Mary, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? And we celebrate this amazing resurrection. Resurrection Sunday, and it's like awesome, and we celebrate, and the songs are about the blood and the cross and the resurrection, and, and friends, it is awesome. And then Monday morning, we go back to life, back to work, and we wait for the next celebration a year later called Easter. Sound like the church today, yes? How many of you know it's not a celebration once a year that we remember something that might have something to do with what we're involved in? It's an everyday, all day celebration. It is finished. Yeah. Yeah. And it has ramifications for lives and how we do life, how we live life, how we be the followers of Jesus He's called us to be. Part of this courage, part of this stirring in our hearts, part of what God's challenging you and I for is to be a people who live in victory. And I'm not here to rah-rah here this evening. I am here to say this. The finished work of Jesus stands forever. Speaking of sport, because we're stuck here for a moment, 
How many of you watched a game, confess, where you already know the score? Yeah, thank you, you and me, sir. The only two honest people in this whole room. It's okay. Man, I watch sport even when I know the score. Why? Because I record it and my friends tell me the score before I get to watch it. So I go home and I watch a game. And you know what happens when you watch a game that you already know the score? It actually makes you relax a little if you know your team won. You actually enjoy watching the game. And I've watched the game going, this doesn't look like my team's going to win. I'm not sure how they did win. But based on what's happening, it doesn't change the score. Why? Because they've already won. And I've said this before, but I was watching it once, my team winning, and I thought, imagine if my team knew that they already won this game. How much more they'd enjoy it. (laughs) Right? Can you imagine a team playing, the score's already done, they won, and they knew it. How much more they'd enjoy that game. (coughs) Now, I'm not sounding American and cliche, and I'm not hyper-faith, but I am telling you this. We know the score. But we don't play this game like we know the score. It's not based on performance or even what we do, although we have a role to play. It's based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. He has done it all. I don't know all of it, but I know the score. And the reason I know the score is because I've read the Bible. And You can skip through a whole lot and just go to the book of Revelation and you'll see the score. He's coming back in full glory. And full splendor. And the first time he came, he came as the lamb, which we sang about. But he's coming back no longer as a lamb. He's not coming back as a lamb to the slaughter. He's coming back as the triumphant king of kings. And the first time he came, most people missed him because of the way he came. But next time he comes, the second coming, every single person on this planet will know. That this king, this righteous judge, this reigning and ruling king is going to come back in full glory and full splendor. And we know the score. That's what gives you and I courage. That's what gives us conviction. That's what stirs us to say we can because he's not on our side. We are on his side. How about we play this game that's not a game, but this thing called life, like we know the score? You see, I know the people in this room that are facing everything the world faces. We're not exempt from it, but we know the score. We carry the pain and this disease and the sickness and the divorce, all the stuff the world faces. Yes, it's there for us too, but we know the score. And when you know the score, you can't lose if you've already won. And I'm not hyper-faith. I'm asking us to believe again where Jesus is seated and what Jesus has done. He puts us with Him there and we get to live in that place. I I do believe the church in Canada is strong. I I, I believe what Jesus is building is unstoppable and unshakable. But I also believe it's got to be a people who believe everything He said, not some of it. And not only believe it, but live in it and believe it enough to actually be what he's called us to be. And I'm challenged by those things. If you've got a Bible, go with me to Psalms, please, 84. Psalm chapter 84. And uh, I, I bring a simple message this evening. But I do believe it's a quite a profound message if we can respond in the way God's called us to. I'm hugely excited for this week. People are from all over the world praying for this time, literally. The, the, there is an excitement in the, in the hearts of people globally for what God wants to do with us in this room. And people are praying like 24 hours a day. People are fasting. People are praying and prophesying. Why? Because God is doing significant things. We don't always know what they are, but we're trusting we will never be the same. Not because we're here, because God is here. Yes. And God is doing stuff in us. And half the time with these equips, we don't even know what He's done until weeks, months, and years later. It's not just what happens here, it's what happens from here. As we go and adjust and be the people God's called us to be. In Psalm 84 verse 5 it says this, Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Can we pause for a moment and say, who's our strength in? Really, it sounds good. It sounds very biblical. But how true is it? 
Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Not in our stuff. Not in each other. Not in what we have. And let me tell you, this is incredibly gifted people. Look at us. Look around. There's some really gifted people. Some good looking people. Some not so good looking people. Some really gifted. I mean, these musicians and talent. Friends, I want to tell you, this is an incredibly gifted people. But you're not blessed if your strength's in the gifts. Is this a good group? Yeah. Is this some group? Yeah. But here's the point. Our strength can't be in our stuff. Now, I know we know that, and we've got to be grateful for what we have, but our strength is in Him. According to Scripture, that's when we're blessed. And the challenge for us is to take what we have and trust in what we have. Trust not in chariots. Trust not in your stuff, in your wisdom. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the strong man boast in his strength, or the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and he knows God. Our strength can't be in this. And while we need each other, and while we have what we have, we're grateful for. God's not calling us to look to what we have. God's calling us to look to Him as God. And allow that to motivate us into the future God has for us. How many of you have enough for what it is God has for us? I'm going to tell you, you don't. And God wants it to be like that. I was saying this morning to the pastors or the leaders, forgive me if you were here, I just have to go here for a moment. It's amazing that there are two miracles in the, Bible, in the, in the, in the Gospels that are, that are in all four Gospels. Two. One, the greatest miracle of all is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there's another miracle that's in all four Gospels. And while it's presented differently, it is in all four. And you know what that is? It's the feeding of the 5,000. Now, there were, I believe more than 5,000, but let's stick with 5,000. There were 5,000 men plus women and children. So I think there was more to like 15,000, but let's stick with five because it's in there. 5,000 men. And Jesus said, and the disciples said, gee, these guys are hungry. So Jesus said, well, give them something to eat. Isn't that amazing? I mean, if you're hungry, feed them. It makes sense, but not in that way. So... They said, well, we don't have anything. So he said, we'll find out what we have got. So they go amongst 5,000 plus people. And they say, what we? They come back and they say, Jesus, we've got five loaves and we've got two fish. You know the story, right? Five loaves, two fish. How many of you, that's not enough for 5,000 people? <laughs> right? What they have is not enough. Jesus knows that. He doesn't think, yeah, that's more than enough. Don't worry. He didn't say, God, I need you to do something. Father in heaven, do He looks up to heaven and he says, thank you. Why is it that all four Gospels carry that miracle? Can I be bold enough to suggest perhaps it depicts life itself? That the vision that God calls us to will always be bigger than the provision we carry in our pockets. And guess what? God made it that way. Why did He do that? So we will always need God to come through rather than we've got this, God. We don't need you, God. And so here it says, blessed are those whose strength is in you. You know, people ask us all the time, and, I, and, and I, I've been preaching a lot around counting and numbers. God does not look for us to count. He looks for us to weigh what we have, not count what we've got. We measure success by counting, but God measures success by weighing. And on that day we all stand before God, He ain't going to bring out a calculator and add up what we've got and how many people and how much money and how much this. He's going to weigh with scales how much of Jesus is in what we're doing. We're challenging our culture and the church culture because it's all about counting rather than about weighing. But in God's economy, it's how much of my son, how much do we reflect Jesus? How much of maturity is in the church today? Being more like Jesus. And that doesn't seem to feature in most people's understanding. But in God's economy, it matters most. Which changes how we go about what we do, right? But wherever we go, people ask us. No one's ever asked me how much of Jesus is in what you're doing. 
But I'll tell you what they're asking. How many churches does NCMI have? And how many places are you planting? And how many nations are you? And friends, people say, ah, oh, you know, because we get different guys. Whoever you get to introduce, they usually say, I like NCMI, Tyron leads this team, and there's like a few hundred people on this team. Is that right, Tyron? Yeah. And then is there like a th- you know, over a hundred nations? Is that right? And, 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 and how many churches? Thousands of churches. You know, and we're kind of a little bit weird and awkward, and then people think, these guys don't know what they're doing. Yeah. I want to tell you, we, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> We have no clue what we're doing except we're doing our best in God to be biblical. But in saying that, we do know what we have somewhere. But we are clearly trying not to tell people what we have because God doesn't want us to talk about what we have. He wants us to trust in what He's doing and not look at what we have and say, this is it, we've got this God. Now I know that doesn't sit well with Maybe you who are uh, 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 accountants here, because you love to count, and that's great because we need you to be counters. But when it comes to the economy of heaven, why is it God says to Abraham, count the stars? Have you tried that? And I have. (laughs) And I have to tell you, I've run out of counting because there are too many. And I've done it from the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, and I still can't get it right. Why? Because there are too many to count. Do you think God knew that when He said to Abraham, count the stars? How about sand? And you don't have a lot of sand on your short seashores here, but there's a lot of rocks. And we went and had some sand. But I mean, you do have some sand. Okay, so. But He says, count all the sand on the, sea, on the seashore, on the, on, the, on the beach. How many of you try to do that? Don't try. Trust me, you can't. If you just pick up a handful and count that, if you can even count what's in your hand, I keep saying you should be working for NASA. Because even what's in your hand is uncountable, let alone all the sand. Now God says, count, you can't. Why? Because what God wants us to know is, it's not what you've got, it's what i got. It's what I'm doing. And so people ask, how many? What is it that David was told not to count his fighting men? What did David do? He did count his fighting men. But God didn't want him not to not know what he's got. God didn't want him to lean on what he's got. God wanted him to lean on God for what God's called him to. That's not blasé, friends, and that's not hyperfaith. That's fact. If this is it and our strength's in this, we don't have the future God has for us. This is it then. We might as well just take what we've got and enjoy the benefits of it. But God is calling the church, His church, us in this room into a greater season of more of what God has. And I want to tell you, not hyper faith, there is more in God for all of us. God is a God of more. Not because Hillsong wrote an album called There Is More, because the Bible is very clear there is more for everyone. God has more. And if you're living in an awesome space, there's still more. If you're struggling, there's more for what God has. There's adjustments, there's changes, but there's a taking of His church into greater things in this season, not based on us, based on the promises of God. And the simple response of yes, Lord, and amen. And we're not leaning on what we have because our strength is in you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca. I love that verse. Passing through the valley of Baca. Again, friends, Baca represents two things. It either represents a um, a giant's, or it represents pain, the valley of pain, place of mourning. How many of you have had a season of pain? Lots of us, let's be honest. I mean, come on, this is, it's tough, right? Place, as they pass through the valley of tears, the place of pain. Or, if you haven't had tears, how many of you have had to take out some giants? My hands and feet are up. Well, we've, we've had to, not wow, look at us, we've had to walk through, take out some giants in a season. And it says, as they pass through the valley of giants or the valley of tears, they don't stay there, they pass through there. They make it a place of spring. It, they don't become like the place they're in, friends. Don't stay where you're at. 
Don't become a people of mourning or tears or a people of dying. Move in to more of what. Don't become like it. Change it to become the way God's called us to be. And it says, the autumn rains also cover it with pools. Look at verse 7. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God. God's heart for us is we go from strength to strength to strength to strength to strength. There is more in God. God is a God of more. Look at the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God of greater anointing, greater inheritance, greater blessing, greater glory, the revealing of God, greater relying on God, greater everything. Jesus said, the things you've seen, John 14, the things you've seen me do, you will do. And even greater. You won't be greater than me. You'll walk in greater things because God's a God of more and greater. Greater doesn't mean easier. But more means more. And God is a God of more. In Canada, God's calling His church to be in the walking in the more. I believe that in our ranks, this is the message God's put on my heart for NCMI. Not because we're good and others are bad. Because God says there is more. All in what we've been called to walk in. As individuals and in our togetherness. I want to tell you there's more. And God's calling us to be a people who go from strength to strength to strength to strength. And it doesn't always make sense in the economy of our lives. Because often He takes us from what seems to be something happening to a place where there's nothing. But if it's God, it's always going to be stronger. Even if it doesn't make sense. And that's the problem is when we begin to weigh it up too much and begin to think, well, I'm leaving this for that. That doesn't make sense. If it's God, it's going to always be stronger. Nicole and I used to say, we relocated from uh, from Australia back to the U.S., a place called Denver, Colorado. (laughs) Never been there before. It was leading a pretty significant church in Australia. Our kids were in a great kids ministry, great school, all the privileges of leading and and then God said, move to a place you've never been and to a place where there's no one you know. And people said, this is the best move for your children. I'm thinking, how is that even possible? There's no one there for them. No friends, no kids ministry, no church. No people we know. Don't NCMI who? Dudley who? Tyron who? Here we go. And I want to tell you, looking back, it was the best. It made no sense to relocate and leave all our family, all our friends, and go to a place we know no one. And I look back in the last 10 years, my children have thrived, not because we're good and they're bad, because God took us from a place of weak strength to a better place of strength. It's the best move we've made, not because we got to do something, because we simply obeyed and pro- believed the promises of God. And all of us in this room have the same testimony to some degree. But the point I'm making tonight is God's calling that church, us, this evening, to go from strength to strength to strength to strength. How many of you want that? Greater anointing, greater inheritance, greater blessing, greater glory, new ways. New things, new territories, new mountains. You know, this thing of mountains is coming through over and over and over again. And and I want to just tell you tonight, mountains are not always obstacles. I think in our hyper-faith understanding and charismatic upbringing or whatever you've been brought up, we always have this thing of a mountain's always an obstacle. And God's given us faith like a mustard seed, just a little bit of faith, and we get to move mountains. And we love that truth. But the other side of it is some of the mountains we're trying to move are actually part of our inheritance. They're not to be cursed or moved. They've been called to be taken. Yes. Mm. It's very good. I challenge us tonight that the call of God from strength to strength is some of us have been called to take mountains in this season. Give me my hill country. Giving us the courage to take mountains. Part of that word, I don't want to read into it too much, but I want to just tell you that word that came with the tongue and interpretation and this thing of courage, God wants to give us courage to take mountains in this season. Yeah. But because we are so obstacle-driven, 
move this mountain, curse this mountain. This is in my way. God, get this thing out of my way. And God says, no, no, that's not a thing. That's your inheritance. Don't curse it. Go and take it. It's part of your inheritance as a church. It's part of your inheritance as individuals. And then we know that. That's what happened. Give me my hill country. Who said that? Caleb. The man who served God, served two leaders, served Moses wholeheartedly, served God wholeheartedly. And then Joshua comes along and leads. And he doesn't say, hey, Joshua, it's my time. Help me curse this mountain and move it. He goes, no, no, give me my mountain, my hill country. Break camp. Take some more mountains. There's some new mountains. There's some new territories to be taken in this season. There's some new challenges God has for us. There's some new battles and battlefronts. There's greater revelation. There's greater anointing. The Holy Spirit's enabling for you and I to do what it is He's called. He wants to lavish us with more anointing, friends. Not weird stuff. Ability to do what it is He's called us to. How many of you don't want that? I know the anointing is a weird thing to many people, I understand. But I believe it's simply the Holy Spirit's enabling for you and I to do what God's called us to do. Who doesn't want that? Business people in this room, God's given you an anointing to lead and to make money and have influence and wealth. That's an anointing. You need that. Not clever books to show you how others have done it. But God empowering us to be who God's called us. Yes. I believe even parenting, you need an anointing with all due respect. And if you don't know that, it's because you're not a parent. And I, I, I'm just saying, it's, uh, give me a million people to lead, I find that far easier than raising three sons in my house. I mean that. And people tell me, read this book, I don't want another book. My kids are not the book's kids. Hello? I can learn from others, but God has to help me lead and raise up my sons. My wife, the most gracious lady on the planet, sorry ladies, my wife is the most, and I still need an anointing on how to husband this wife of mine. I don't need another book. I need the Holy Spirit's enabling to lead God's people, to go where God's called us to do. And honestly, friends, there's more anointing for the task that lies ahead for every individual in this room. Yes. We need Spirit-filled, Spirit-moved, Spirit-sent people. That's conviction and courage. Greater glory. Difference between anointing and glory. Glory is God revealing Himself. How many of you know God is a God who wants to reveal Himself? He's not this retiring God, distant God. In creation, He had fun making and developing and showing and creating. Why? So people could see Him. He wants people to know Him. He wants people to see Him and He's revealing Himself. And He wants to do that more to His people in this season. Revealing Himself to us. The greater glory, the promise of the Father, the glory of the former is nothing for the glory of the future. Greater inheritance. You know, an inheritance, can I just remind us this evening, is not something you achieve. It's something you receive. And there's a lot of teaching around inheritance, but it's all about fighting for your inheritance and taking it. And I understand that we need to go and contend, but it's not something we can achieve. It's something you are given. My dad and my mom, they're not dead yet, praise God, for me. But my father said this, I don't want to give my children their inheritance when I'm dead. I would rather downscale. This is my dad. That's so wonderful. I'll downscale and live in the smaller place and I'm going to sell everything I have and I want to give my sons, my three sons, their inheritance while I'm alive. And he said, I want to give it to you. And I'm not telling you what you're allowed to do with it because it's your money. But this is what I'm suggesting. Putting it towards a house. Do what you want, but put it towards a house. <laughs> and I listened. I'm going to live a long time because I've listened to my parent. <laughs> it's going well for me, apparently. So I took it and I put it towards a house. Not bought a house. It wasn't that much. Put it towards. Put down payment. Able to buy. And by the grace of God, we've been able to get a nice house. But the thing I want to tell you about this inheritance that I was given is I never did a single thing for it. The only reason I and my three brothers, uh, two brothers received it is because of our last name. That's it. 
I didn't do a single thing. I was just simply born into the family. And because of me being born in, I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. I'm not better than my other brothers. We all three got equally the same amount. Simply based on being the sons, and do- uh, sons of Dudley and Anne. Now, why is that important? Because so often this whole thing becomes about achieving and going fighting for something. And I just want to tell you, an inheritance is given by God, not because we don't deserve it or earn it, simply because we belong to Him. It is a good word, isn't it? It's a great word. But I want to tell you, there's a difference between legacy and inheritance. And I believe inheritance is what we leave for people. But legacy is what we leave in people. And we need to be doing both, not one. And I think we're really good at leaving the next generation an inheritance. But we're stepping on people's heads to give them an inheritance rather than investing in people. Jesus built an inheritance for us, but he also built things in people. And friends, I want to tell you, the church needs to build in people, not just for people. Big difference between legacy and inheritance. But I believe there's greater inheritance for all of us. It's received, not achieved. Greater expectation. Again, Ephesians 3.20, Now to Him who is able to immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to His power that works within us. Friends, how many of you believe there's more? Let me tell you, I have an imagination. And I've imagined some stuff. But he says there's more than what you can imagine. And there's got to be a greater expectation within us. What about a Gideon? Gideon was a good man who simply just wanted to feed his family. And God looked at him and said, I don't want you to feed your family. I want you to feed a nation. What about Abraham, the father of our faith? All he wanted was a son. He was desperate for a son. And the father looked at him and said, I don't want you to just have a son. I want you to father a nation. That's huge. God always wants more for you and our friends. And we just want that thing that we so desperately want. And God says, I want so much more for you. God rescues us and He rescues our situations. I believe part of this next season, He wants to rescue some situations to give us better than what we have. I can tell you, living testimony, God has done that recently in our lives. He doesn't just rescue my life. I always used to think He wants to rescue my life. He rescues situations and turns them around. And you can't script what God does. Because if you can script it, then you're missing. Because it's going to be bigger than what God is. If you know me, this is not normal what I preach. I'm not hyper faith here. But I'm telling you, we, the church, have to shift our thinking and believe again for the future God has for us. And I want to be that church. Yes. Another thing God's restoring is authenticity. Mm-hmm. Reality. Not the weird nonsense we call church. Mm-hmm. Not the imitation. I don't believe that the devil's fighting the church. Or opposing it. Can I tell you what I believe? The devil's joining the church. Mm-hmm. He does more harm by imitation than opposition. And if we don't know the difference, I believe a lot of what the church has become in Canada and the U.S. and around the world, actually a lot of it needs to die in order for the true church Jesus is building to be raised up again. I believe He wants to bring clarity, more clarity in this season. Clear thinking, clear understanding, blowing the trumpet that makes sense, that we know in our hearts, it's clear. It's not this, I wonder, could this be, should this be, but a clarion call. You know, you know when we talk about uh, Peter stepping out of the boat, you remember the story, and walking on water? In actual fact, he wasn't necessarily walking on water. I believe he was walking on God's Word. Yep. Why is that? Because he said, if this is you, Lord, tell me to come. And the Lord said, come. He stepped out, not on water. He stepped out on the Word of God. Which happened to be water. Focus rather on the Word than the water. But God's saying clarity. See, I think the devil seeks to destroy us. But I don't believe he's been given the power to destroy us. But he does get the power to distract us. And he destroys us by distracting us. 
And that's why the Lord is calling for a trumpet sound that is clear for you and I to know exactly what we're called to and to stick to the God plan so we get to walk in the God purpose. I believe there's greater liberty, freedom. Can I say to you this evening, get free, stay free, and keep everyone else free. Where do you see that in the Bible? Everywhere. And a man called Paul who wrote to the church and he said, it's for freedom. You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm in your freedom and do not allow the yoke of slavery to be put on us. And all I can say is Jesus came to set us free. Are you free? Because if you're not free, you're making everyone else in bondage, keeping others in bondage. Friends, I, I want to suggest there's a lot of us that are carrying nonsense that the Lord says, I want to liberate you. I want to take it from you. Jesus Christ is truth. Yeah. The way, the truth, the life. Freedom comes through truth, knowing Christ. The more I know Him, the more free I am. The more I walk with Him, the more He takes stuff off me. But if I walk from Him and I walk with the church, I get stuff put on me. And that's a dangerous thing for Canada when the church is carrying stuff and I'm not free. Get free tonight and then stay free. And in doing that, we'll keep everyone else free. I'm shocked, forgive me, by the spiritual abuse that takes place in the church today. And I'll tell you why it is. It's because either sheep are not free or shepherds are not free. Sheep also abuse shepherds. But shepherds abuse sheep. And I'll tell you why. Because we are not free. We've got to get free. Stay free. I believe there's greater activation and empowering all generations. How many of you believe in all generations? We're not about young and old. We're about all. God is a God of generations. We think in weeks, months, and years. God thinks in generations. God's not about weeks and months and years. He's about God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Friends, we've got to build for beyond us. We've got to build for generations. We've got to think and empower all generations. We were recently in the UK... And uh, anyone been to the UK? I know you honor her, the Queen, and that's great. But we were there recently in ministry, and there's some cathedrals there. Have you ever heard, seen some of those cathedrals that were built in the Middle Ages? They say they took 70, 80, 90 years to build. What's amazing is those who began building that planted trees that would take 70, 80 years to grow. But they planted trees. They put seed in the soil of the buildings they began to build next to them, knowing that the next generation would need a roof on those cathedrals. And so they would sow seed and plant 70, 80 years later, trees that would be ready to be put on the roof for the next generation. I, I, I hear that and I'm challenged. Because the majority of us, to heck with them, we just do our thing. And then their thing comes along and they've got nothing left because we messed it all up. Why? Because we care about us, not them. See, so anything, can I just say this? Whatever dies with us is an ambition. It's not a, a vision from God. Because God is a God of vision and generations. And if this generation, if it dies with our generation, it was, it's, a, it's a man's ambition, not a vision. Because God is a God of generations. Activating and empowering all generations. Governance, greater governance. I believe God's giving us greater governance. It's a major issue. Okay, so that's all great, and I hope you're excited about our future. <laughs> I hope you are, because I am. But here's what I want to say. There's a God factor, and there's an our factor. You cannot earn the blessing of God. You cannot earn the provision of God, but we can stop it by disobedience. And this is the message I want to bring tonight for a moment. You see, we've often said this, I'm sure you've heard it, but success in the kingdom is a succession of yeses to the king. It's not a one-off, yes, Lord. It's constantly saying yes to God. That's success. Can I suggest it's not even the result that's successful. It's saying yes to the king is where our success comes. And I think too many, if I can be honest, are worried about what it looks like before we say yes. But God is calling His people in this room, including this man preaching. I want a people who successfully, continually say yes, yes, yes. 
rather than I'm not sure, that's enough, no more. Show me first. I need to see it all. I need to weigh it up. I need to count the cost and take scripture that tells me count the cost. You've counted it by saying, yes, Lord. You're in. You're all in. And how many know for all in to work, you need all in? Covenant and partnership. And I love covenant and partnership. And I've used this illustration. I'm just, a lot of things come into my mind here. I hope it's the Lord. If it's not, forgive me. It's the pizza I don't eat. So, before Nicole and I, my beautiful wife, got married, we got marriage counseling, which is a good thing. But I think we should do marriage counseling after a year of marriage, to be honest. I think that's probably more helpful. But anyway, that's fine. And, and so I was in ministry. I was on this team, and I was uh, an elder in a church. And so I thought, I, I need my wife to get some counsel of what it means to actually be married to this man of God. <laughs> so I picked someone I, would, I really believed in and good marriage. This guy's been married for 150 years, and they're still happily married, and not quite that long. But Leon and Pat Fondal, if you've ever heard of them, they are passionately in love with each other. It's sickening how they... Hold hands still at this age. I'm like, gross, just back. I'm just being honest. And so I was like, babe, you and I are going to sit with them and they're going to tell you some things. And that was the plan. So we're sitting having dinner and, uh, and so Leon looks at me and says, Tyron, you, you, you get him married because you're selfish. Nicole, you get him married because you're selfish. And because of that, this marriage cannot work. This is not the discussion I was there hoping for. <laughs> So I I said, well, hang on. What do you mean? He said, you're getting married for what you can get from Nicole. She's getting married for what she can get from you. Going into a marriage like that, you guys are destined to fail. He said, you need to go tiring into this marriage, saying, what can I give? And Nicole, she needs to come into this marriage, what can I give? Then your marriage will succeed. Now, I'm going to say that's true in marriage, but I want to say it's true in any partnership, especially with God. And here's what I want to tell you. God is all in. On His side, He's done everything. He's calling us tonight. I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm doing it all. I'm calling you. Whose side are you on? Not yours. You on His side. But what He's asking of us, are, are we all in? All in means succession of yeses. To the king. See, God accomplishes the most not when we work for him, but when we are faithful to him, obedient enough for him to work through us. Let me ask you do you and I see obedience as an opportunity or an obligation? John 14 15 to 18, Jesus said, If you love me, you will obey me. He goes on and says, if you do not love me, verse 23 and 24, if you do not love me, you won't obey me. Is it an opportunity for us or is it an obligation? How many of you know, if it's an opportunity, we're going to say yes. If it's an obligation, it becomes something that we eventually say no more. We've heard, I've preached on this many times. Jesus' love language is obedience. And I believe obedience is simply the outward expression of your love for Jesus. If you have an obedience problem, the fact is you have a love problem. If you love Him, you'll obey Him. It's that simple, I believe. When you think about it, it's the actual heart of the Great Commission. Being honest, I grew up in the church. I always used to think this Great Commission was all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Jesus said, now go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey. And we used to be thinking, well, that means take a Bible and beat people over their head because, listen, you need to obey God. You need to obey the Word. And we throw truth at them and we make them obey. Do you think that's what Jesus was saying? He doesn't want us to obey out of obligation. And that's the church today. He wants people to obey out of love because it's an opportunity to keep saying yes. Most people in the church today are obeying Him so unhappily, no one wants to be part of the church. It's true. Why are you so grumpy? I'm obeying Jesus. <laughs> Seriously. That's, I mean, who, I know I'm about to get in trouble. If, I don't want to get married. I don't want to live a marriage where my wife's grumpy all the time because she's married to me and obeying something. What love do you have? Imagine Jesus. You're so unhappy, church, because you have to obey me. And we're trying to win the world for Jesus. When Why are we grumpy? Because we're obeying Jesus. No, 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 seriously, we've got to fix this. 
You know how? Fall in love with Him. The more I love Him, the more I want to obey, friends. And this is not for the ladies here. This is for us, men and women, as followers of Christ, saying, yes, Lord, yes, succession of yeses to the King. That's success in the kingdom of God. Teaching them to love. Matthew chapter 7. Go read it. Verse 24 and 25. Jesus said this. The difference between a foolish builder and a wise builder is in doing what he says. He says, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And when the storm comes, the house stands strong. He goes on, he says, but anyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. And when, not if, when the storm comes, the house crashes. What's the difference between wise and foolish? It's not in hearing. It's not even in receiving. It's in doing. Jesus believed big time in obedience. In Luke chapter 11, go read this. I'm just throwing a few verses and then I want to just land with a story from Scripture. But in Luke chapter 11, verse 27 and 28, Jesus is teaching radical stuff. He's showing stuff. He's doing stuff. Go read it. And it says, as Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. Now, I mean, that's a good statement, right? I mean, I want you to honor my mom. I'd be like, yeah, thank you very much. You're right. My mother is awesome. But Jesus didn't say that. You know what he said? No, no. He replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. John chapter 2, the first miracle Jesus ever did. You know what it was? Turning water into wine. I, I'm not fighting a system or a culture. I'm not even fighting a religion out there. But there's a religion who's elevated Mary to the Godhead. Now, if you believe in the Godhead as Mary part of it, can I tell you, Mary, the mother of Jesus, gave one command in her whole life. You know what it is? Do whatever Jesus tells you to do. That was the only command of Mary. And her command was, do what Jesus says. But in the turning water into wine, her response was simply this, do whatever he tells you to do. And they listened and did it. And guess what? The best wine they had. In actual fact, the carcass came out and said, this is a different wedding. Most weddings, you bring out your best wine first. But you guys have saved the best to last. Why? Because they did whatever Jesus told them to do. I'm challenged. I mean, I would have loved to have been there to see it, but to be the one who... Whatever he says, I'm not sure that's me. You see, when obedience ceases to be an irritant and becomes our quest in that moment, God will endow us with his power. I believe there are many great examples in Scripture of people who prove their love for God, not by word, not by song, but by deed. Somebody said that Christians don't tell lies, they sing them in their hymns. <laughs> yes, Lord, I love you, Lord. I'll go wherever, where you go, I'll go, where you say, I'll... not me, Lord. <coughs> right? We will say it and sing it, but go and do it, not so much. But right through Scripture, we see people who obeyed God. And can I say, what's exciting about the obedience is this. It didn't just bless them. More importantly, it brought blessing and changing lives to others. That's the challenge of the Father for us tonight. Who or what is standing on the other side of our obedience? Who or what is waiting for us to obey? And in our response... We're going to see miracles. In our response, we're going to reach people who are waiting and God's calling us to respond. It's not just about us. Not just about the blessing. Not just about the more. Who's waiting? What's waiting on the other side of our obedience? The miraculous. We love the stories of the miraculous, but we don't like the lead up to the miraculous. Somebody had to step out in faith and obedience, and that's where God came through. I want to tell you what lies ahead for us. is going to take a response to say, Yes, Lord. 
<clears throat> Abraham, Moses. Moses was helping people rescue. They cried out, rescue us from Egypt. What did God do? He called Moses. Moses had all the reasons why he can't. But God still waited patiently. And Moses' response brought Israel out of Egypt, out of captivity. Joshua, which we heard about already tonight, brought pre people into their inheritance in response. David, Jesus, the greatest example of all. So with that, let's land with this. Go with me to Luke chapter 5. Are you okay, friends? Luke chapter 5. I know you know the story. I'm sure you've heard it preached so many times. But recently, as I've been reading this, it's caught my attention. And I want to just tell you, we love to talk about the miraculous catch, but a whole lot of stuff happened before that catch. And I believe just as we land, God wants to highlight a couple of things from this story. I must confess, I'm not a fisherman and I don't like fishing. And I know it's probably the wrong place to say that. <laughs> I will eat the fish you catch, but I want nothing to do with catching. It's boring. It is. I'm sorry, it is. I mean, I, even, the only time I want to fish is where... What? You need deliverance? Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Listen. The only time I want to fish, and I'm still thinking about it, is when fish are jumping out of the water into my boat. But then I don't want to scale them and whatever. I just want to eat it, all right? So you catch it, I'll eat it, and we're happy. But I'm going to give the story. You're going to see my ignorance of why I don't like fishing. And all, but I want to use this story. And I believe God wants to speak to us tonight as individuals from this story. I've been so challenged by this story. Luke chapter 5, verse 1, it says, One day... As Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at water, the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. Now again, forgive my ignorance, but I've done a little bit of study here about fishing in those days. <laughs> These guys left two boats and they were cleaning their nets. Listen guys. They were cleaning their nets even though they caught no fish. In other words, they had fished all night. They hadn't caught one fish, but they still had to clean the nets like they had caught fish. Why? Because if they let the, the, the nets go, it's going to mess the nets up. and so, so they're cleaning. How many of you, let's be honest here, have done something and have seen no fruit in it? Come on. I mean, how many of you have spent a lot of time doing something and you're going to have to almost like it happened, but it didn't happen. So you're still cleaning it like you caught something, even though you caught nothing. I mean, I'm trying to present the picture here because we love to read these stories of Jesus. But put yourself in the fisherman's shoes or sandals. And one of the first jobs I ever had, and believe it, I had some real jobs before I had this unreal job that I just tell people what to do and don't really live a real life. <laughs> Floating in the clouds with me and Jesus while you all work for Pharaoh. I get to work for the king. I mean, all the nonsense of it. I had some real jobs. <laughs> Serious. And one of the first jobs I had was a real waste of time. And I was a salesman in Australia selling a product that nobody needed. You laugh, it's fine. And, and I had to wear a suit. And it was in the heat, not of Canada, of Australia, where there's no ozone, apparently. And I used to have to wear a full suit and a full tie. And what happened was, we'd get picked up at like 6, 7 in the morning and driven to some little town, one of the villages there or city, and they would drop about 5 or 6 of us and say, we will see you at like 5 p.m. tonight. And we say, okay, that's great. No car, no transport. We get dropped off and get picked up. And what we had to do in our suits in the heat of the day, go knock on doors. Cold canvas. And my job was to get leads, not to sell, just to get a lead for someone else to come sell. And I'd have to knock on the door and say, hi, my name is Tyrant, and I'm from Prime Security Systems. Selling security systems to a country in those days where there was no crime. I mean it. I moved from Africa. There was crime. I'm now convincing Australians in retirement they need to spend $2,000 on a system they don't need. 
I'm not joking. You laugh. It was horrible. And so I'd knock on the door, and I would try and be nice and say, my tire. And they go, we're not interested. I don't need this. And I say, okay. And then I, it was BC times, before Christ, not British Columbia, before Christ. <laughs> so I would have to, like, tell a few little porky pies. How's that? <laughs> Little, a few little white lies. It's sales. That's what I was taught. I'm sorry. I just listened to my boss, which is what I was supposed to do. And so I say, uh, you don't need one. Oh, really? Is that right? Do you know such and such person lives around the corner? They go, no. I said, well, you should know them. And by the way, they got robbed last night, beaten up. I'm sorry. I know. I just before Christ. Well, with Christ, but walked away for a season. And I'm just telling you. And they'd be like, Really? I'm like, yeah. They go, well, we got dogs and burglar. Oh, no, they came through the roof and they removed the tile. I'm impressed. <laughs> Seriously. No, I'm trying to get so. I'm sorry. I'm just telling you. But here's the thing. It was commission-based with no salary. So I would go two, three weeks of walking day in and day out in a hot sun, in a suit, knocking on doors, and not get paid one cent. I've paid my dues. <laughs> and then I'd have to get the guy in, and then if he gets in there, even in it, he generally didn't get the sale anyway. And then I'd be like, it's not even based on me, it's based on their sale. Why don't you let me sell it? I could sell it. Anyway, that's my problem, and I'm, I'm working it out. But, <laughs> but I want to say this these guys had fished all night, and they caught nothing. But they were still cleaning their nets because their ne nets had to be cleaned even if they caught nothing. The whole night fishing. Now, you guys enjoy fishing because it's fun for you. This was their job. It's how they made money. It was their income. And they worked all night and didn't make one dime. There were two boats. Why were there two? Because they say that those nets were not these little nets that we used today. They were at least 12 feet long. They were heavy nets. And they needed two boats next to each other to hold the nets. Are you seeing the context here? They're cleaning the nets, even though they've caught nothing. Jesus comes along and says, hey, guys, I need your boat. <clears throat> now, that's good enough to say, okay, well, there's our boat. Now he's using their boat to speak. And to, this is the context we have here. All right, so let's read on. Verse 3, it says, He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. <laughs> Do you understand? They had been fishing all night and caught nothing. They've just finished cleaning the nets. They now lend Jesus their boat so he can preach from it. Now he's saying, hey, by the way, finish preaching, put your nets out in the day. In, in the, even I know that you don't fish in the day with those nets. Why? Because those nets reflect the sun. Fish can see the nets. <laughs> they can see the nets. That's why they fished at night when they can't see it. Now Jesus said, you fished all night and caught nothing. You finished cleaning your nets, throw them out in the full day. Are you seeing this? Now, I'm just going to be, I'm trying to honor here, but let me tell you this. Jesus was a carpenter. <laughs> I mean, if, Je if Jesus said, listen, guys, I'm going to teach you how to build a table so you can put fish on when you catch it, it would make, no, I'm not joking, it would make more sense. How, how, but Jesus, as a carpenter, tells a fisherman to do something that he really doesn't know what he's saying. How many of you have been told by people who don't know what they're doing? To, I mean, friends, I get told everywhere by people who've done nothing what I should do. I, I'm serious. There's so many experts who've done nothing who tell me what. How many of you got those people around? Don't they irritate you? They tell you what to do when they don't have a clue what you do. Now, I'm not mocking because this was Jesus, but this was the context. Fished all night, caught nothing, cleaned our nets, gave Jesus our boats to speak, now he's saying, take your clean nets in full day as a carpenter, throw them into the water. <laughs> Come on. But here's the response. 
Simon answered. I'm glad he told Jesus first. He answered, Master. That to me is the revelation right there. Master. We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Now most of us would probably say, there you go. Master. We've done this. We've tried this. We gave it a go. Been there, done that. But look at how he responds. Master, we have worked hard all night and we've caught nothing. But, but, because you say so. But because you say so. We will let down the nets. And when they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they became filled with boats. Both boats so full that now the boats are sinking. And Simon saw this. He fell at his knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you'll catch men. So they pulled up their boats and on the shore, and they left everything, and they followed him. Great story. I learned that in Sunday school. How real is that for you and I? Who or what is waiting on the other side of our obedience? A couple of thoughts around this. Number one, revelation. Number one, master. Honestly, friends, if he's not master, we're not going to obey. The revelation of Christ as Lord and Savior needs to break in again to his church if we're going to be the people who walk in the more of what God has. Master, not just Savior. See, that revelation of master is the most strategic revelation. It's the re revelation that lacks in the church in our country, North America, in Australia, and some of the Western culture, is we love the Savior dynamic, but don't give us the Lordship stuff. And I'm going to suggest, if it's Savior alone, no, will we never respond to the master. How do you see Jesus? Some CEO, some corporate CEO in the church. Is he your life coach? Is he your co-pilot, your co-sufferer? Some great teacher, some, someone you lean in and lean on, your friend, your whatever. Is he Jesus Christ as Lord? If he's not Lord, he's not going to be master in our lives. And master is not something we fear. It's understanding a submission. You know, only in the kingdom of God, please hear this, only in God's kingdom... Does surrender bring victory? Everywhere else, surrender brings defeat. But in the kingdom of God, when we surrender to the Lord, some of us this evening are facing stuff and we want to break through and maybe it's sin or whatever it is and we're trying. Some of us in our ministry, whatever, we're doing stuff, please. And the Lord says, come to a place of surrender and you'll find victory. Get on your knees before me and lay it down and see me as master. And that's where your breakthrough comes. But we try and do it in ourselves because we're not quitters and we're not giver uppers. But we need to quit and give up and get on our knees. And that's the place we find victory. Master. Bible tells us if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart, God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Salvation is not just based on Savior, it's based first on Lord. I, I, I've shared this many times. I read scripture after scripture, and if we don't see Christ as Lord, honestly, he might be some concept, but if he's not Lord and not Master, honestly, friends, we will never obey what he says. That story when Jesus is sitting with his disciples, another story, and he's sitting there and he's eating with them on the last night before he was betrayed. Probably the most horrific night in Scripture for me. And I'm thinking, what a story. And they're sitting together. There wasn't a group this big. There were 12 of them. It was a small little holy huddle. And Jesus said, this is the last time we're going to do this. And someone here is going to betray me. One of you. Not even this group. 12 of us. 
Do you know the story? And what did they say? One at a time. Friends, if I was in that room, I'm telling you, this pastor would take his pastor's hat off, apostolic hat, and every other hat, and headbutt anyone and everyone who's messing with Jesus. I'm just being honest. But you know what they did? One by one said, surely not me, Lord. Surely not I, Lord. Not me, Lord. And Judas, the betrayer, who Jesus knew he was going to betray him, put him at his right side, the place of honor. Isn't Jesus incredible? He put the betrayer at his place of honor. And every one of the disciples said, Not me, Lord. Surely not I, Lord. And guess what? Judas, who's the one who did betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Teacher. How do you view Jesus? Teacher? Good dude? Philosopher? Yes, he is the Son of God, but really, God's the real God. He's the mini God. Jesus is fully God. And Jesus is fully reigning. And Jesus is master and he's head of the church and he's head of our lives. And he's calling his church to get back to his revelation of lordship and master. And when he's our Lord and master, we say yes before we even know what we're saying yes to because he's master and Lord. Friends, I don't want to overemphasize this. Can you imagine this group of people representing this master as yes, Lord. Can you imagine how Canada would be different? Just from this group right here, who have revelation, yes, Lord, master, because you say so. I still think it's the primary battle front in the, front in the church today is the truth about Jesus. Amen. Secondly, not only master or revelation of master, we need a relationship with Jesus. It's amazing when, when Jesus talked about the, 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 the talents and he said, that, he said that the one he gave to five talents, the one he gave two, and the one he gave one. And the one with five doubled it. And the one with two doubled. But the one with one dug a hole and hid it. And he said, I know, Master, I was afraid of you. And so, I, friends, you can't serve Jesus being afraid of him. So when we talk master, it's not the fear we carry, it's the revelation of where we sit on this and where we, where we serve in this economy of Jesus as the king of his kingdom. And this kingdom doesn't revolve around us, it revolves around Christ. And we are subjects of the king, he's not our king, to hook us up as subjects. But if you only have revelation of, say, of master and revelation of, of lordship without relationship with him, we don't have anything. And so I want to suggest that we need to build our relationship. And it's not based on each other or your leaders or your family. It's based on you and your Lord. It's not enough to have faith in others to help you in your faith with Jesus. I mean, friends, I, this nation and the world is splattered people all over who have had their faith in people. Had their faith in ministry, had their faith in the church, had their faith in leadership, had their faith in a group of people. And all of them are fed up and hurt. Why? Because their faith was in someone other than Jesus. And it's not up to our leaders to help us fall in love with Jesus. It's up to us to build our own relationship with Jesus. And I'm saying the church that Jesus is building has revelation of lordship, but also has an individual relationship with every follower of Jesus. How's your relationship with God? Are you building that? And I want to tell you, he wants, He's all in. He's not holding out. He's not handpicking a few of us who are really holy. He's all in for all people and wants relationship with everyone. He's waiting and calling. And I believe we've got to dig deep in our relationship with Jesus. God doesn't only communicate with us. He wants to commune with us. We don't just go to God for a word. We go to God because He's God, our Father. Do you love Him? Are you building that relationship with Him? Are you In our effort as the church to do stuff for Him, let's not lose our relationship with Him. 
I do believe He's calling us to deepen our relationship. And in that response, we can trust Him more because we know Him. He's not just master. He's our friend. We're walking with. Build your relationship. The greatest thing I can do in ministry is build my relationship with Jesus. Honestly, friends. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew this 20-something years ago because I nearly burnt out in ministry, doing ministry to help people. Hearing God for the next preach. Download. God, give me a word. I need a word. I'm going to preach tonight. I'm going to leave this equip. I'm going to speak to my team. God, and God knows all that. Imagine going to God all the time because I need a word. God's like, what kind of father am I? Do you think it's just a download every time I see you? Or how about hanging out with me? Now, God knows we need words. But let me tell you, sometimes you don't need a word. You just need God to reveal himself and build a relationship because that's where we get to trust God. And the life we carry in our ministries comes from a relationship, not a download from heaven. Thirdly, our requests. Our requests. You see, the vision will always come before the provision. And I think the two greatest challenges we face as the church, I've said this before, is our inability to hear God. And secondly, our unwillingness to do what He says. We fished all night. This would be a great selective hearing time. Surely he didn't say, I must throw the net out in the day. Wrong. Does not sound right. Wrong. Doesn't suit. I'll wait till tonight to throw the net out because that makes sense. There's selective hearing. Then we need to stop selecting and saying yes, yes, yes. Doesn't make sense but I trust you. John 10, sheep know the voice of their shepherd. The role, our roles do not define our ability or our willingness to hear it. Our relationship defines that. You know, my wife, Nicole, I can be in a room with hundreds of people and I can hear Nicole. And it's not because she's my wife. It's because I've built a relationship with her. Not because of her role as my wife. It's because of my relationship with her. I'm going to challenge us tonight. We need to know Him. Not because of our role, because of our relationship. You cannot expect to hear direction from God if you haven't cultivated connection with Him. (coughs) Unwillingness to do what He says. God's calling us, friends. Number four, respond. Respond. Response. The devil seeks to destroy us, as I said, but he only has the power to distract us. And I think the response, our willingness and desire to be obedient to Jesus, I believe is the heart of our entire faith walk. Obedience is an act of faith. Disobedience is really a result of unbelief. Only he who believes, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, only he who believes is obedient. And only he who is obedient believes. He goes on, he says, one act of obedience is better than a hundred sermons. What hinders our response? Familiarity. Fear. Finances. Lack of faith. Fished all night, caught nothing. Being there, done that. There's no fish in the sea. Why? Because we've done this but because you say so. That's got to be the response. And lastly, the reward. There's a reward in obedience. They caught such a miraculous catch. You can't script that. Even one fish would have been enough, better than what they got. But they got so many fish, they had to call the other boat over, friends. And the other boat sank with them. Why? Because God did what God said He would do, but He needed an act of obedience for that to happen. It would have been easier if they just arrived there and the fish jumped into their boat before they put the nets up. <laughs> then I'd be a good fisherman. But it didn't. He said, put your nets in. In a time when it doesn't make sense. But they did it again in obedience. Because you said so. And what was the reward? A miraculous catch. That would not have taken place 
if they didn't respond to God. And not only was their boat full, others were filled with the provision, the blessing of their obedience. Who or what is on the other side of our obedience? Canada. People are waiting. Miracles are waiting. God says there's more. But I believe there's some of us who say, been there, done that. Fished all night, caught nothing. Makes no sense. But, because you say so. Let's bow our heads, please. Friends, radical obedience. Radical obedience. Can you imagine being in a place where we can say yes before we know what we're saying yes to? That's what God calls of us. I believe that. I stand here not as an expert in this, but I want you to know in my heart I'm contending for that. I want to say yes before I know what I'm saying yes to. Why? Because I trust Him and because there's stuff waiting on the other side of my obedience. There is more. But success in the kingdom is not results. Success in the kingdom is a succession of yeses to the king. Leaders, leading churches, we've got to say yes to God. We've got to go where he's called us to go and lead God's people to that place. It's not convenient. It makes no sense. But if God says it, we do it. The church needs to throw the net out again. The church needs to do and say yes to what God says. I'm going to ask us just to keep our eyes closed for a moment. This is, again, nobody's business and we're done. But there's got to be a response tonight, friends. Don't go home and pray. Don't think. Just if you need to respond, would you be bold enough? Just stand up where you are. Say, Lord, I, I've actually got to respond. No, not calling you out, not pointing you out, just as a response, Lord, I fished all night, but I've caught nothing, but because you say so, just stand, please, I'm standing, because I'm telling you, every time I hear this, I'm standing, don't do it now, because I'm doing, this, this is business, this is a week of God doing stuff in us, This is freedom, friends. He's calling us to Him. He's calling us to walk, not on water, to walk on His Word, which means we're going to do stuff that cannot be done. But it's coming back to that place of, I trust you, and I say yes. I don't have to add it up and weigh it up, and what's this going to cost? I'm all in, and I trust you. And I obey. And I have said yes, but to this moment, I want to keep saying yes to this king. Father, you see literally just about everyone here today are standing, including me. And we don't want to just respond out of emotion. We ask for faith tonight. We've heard about faith and courage. But would you give us faith and courage to keep saying yes? I pray for such clarity in this moment that it's not what we want, it's what you want. That there's a loud beckoning that comes from heaven. That we get to walk on water. That we get to catch miraculous fish. That miracles are waiting. Signs and wonders. Breakthroughs. The things you've promised are around the corner. And we cannot earn it, but we simply obey in order to receive. And our results are not driven by what we get. The result, it's just simply, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. You know, you know just, just keep, let me just say this. Significance is probably what all of us are contending for. And I want to tell you this. There is nothing more significant than doing what it is God's called you to do. Our significance is not in what we do. 
our significance is in saying yes to the king. Don't value what you're doing by the result. Value what you're doing by your response. Obedience is what God calls of us. And Father, I pray again that we don't do this out of duty and obligation. Maybe we can have moments of that, but let it be a lifestyle of opportunity. May it not be an irritant to us, obedience, but may it be a joy of our lives. I pray for revelation of lordship to grow in us. That this master revelation will be our revelation. That we don't just preach it, we live it day in and day out. I pray that you'll strengthen our relationship with you. That you'll grow our relationship. Holy Spirit, would you help us in our walk with Jesus? Would you show us? Would you, it's not a, a means to an end. It's the reason we exist. Would you help us in the responding to the requests? Would you help us not to silence and, and, and close our ears to choose, pick and choose, but just to be willing and saying yes every moment of our lives? And Lord, the rewards, the promise of the more. May we see more of that as we just keep saying yes. May we reach more people. May we touch more lives. May we see more cities won for you. May we see more churches established and planted. May we see more people coming to you. May, may we see more miracles and signs and wonders and more of your provision and more miraculous catches that blow people away because our God is awesome and we simply obey. I thank you for your church that you're building in this nation. I thank you for these men and women standing here today. And I pray, honestly, that we will never be the same again. And that our regions and cities will never be the same. Because simply we trust and obey. And Jesus, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We say you are worthy. You are worthy. And you're the reason we exist. And it's all because of you. And we choose to not be obliged, but to be, have this opportunity. Because of our love for you, we want to obey you. Count us in, all in. Not what can we get, what can we give. And we know that you are all in. Help us to be all in with you. I pray freedom tonight, not bondage. People leave here free, free, liberated by their response. It's not heavy and harsh. This is freedom that you bring to your people. Would you liberate us to liberate others? We thank you this evening for your kindness, your mercy, and your goodness. And we bless you in your glorious name. Thank you, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen.